Um, hi everyone. Um, my name is Sasha. Um, and today I will be talking about the work that we did uh, with collaboration uh, with uh, in collaboration with Adam Forney during an internship at Microsoft Research last summer. And in that work, we explored um, conversational cues in guided task support with virtual assistants. So let's talk a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay. Let's talk a bit more about what we mean by a virtual assistant. So we know there uh, exist uh, Cortana and Siri, um, Google Assistant, and so on. But today we will focus mainly on uh, screenless devices that only rely on um, audio input from the users. So we know from surveys that uh, with these devices, people normally just uh, settle down on some simple commands like setting up a timer, checking the weather, um, and so on. So let's look at what a uh, sample interaction might look like. Uh, first, you pronounce an activation word or wake word, hey Google, Cortana, Alexa, what have you, uh, and follow by the um, you follow that by your question, and you get an answer. Then, if you want to continue the, the interaction, you have to go through the exact same process: uh, activation word, uh, quer a question, and the answer. Now, recently, companies have started um, sort of experimenting in the field of supporting. Uh, more complex multi-step tasks, and one example of that would be cooking a culinary recipe. And um, if we look at a multi-step task, this is what it uh, might look like. So it's basically a collection of um, several single-step tasks. Uh, if we take a bit, uh, if we look a bit closer, we can see immediately the problem here. Um, every interaction needs uh, an activation word, and it's not specific to Google. We have. Um, major, all major assistants work this way now. So uh, this is pretty far away from what we would experience um, in human-to-human -human uh, interaction. Now let's go back to our previous example of a simpler interaction. Uh, and here we can see that uh, the assistant only captures explicitly formulated queries uh, that are explicitly addressed to the, uh, to the assistant uh, missing out on everything, all the signal that's happening in between the um, conversational turns. Uh, and we know from the um, analysis of human-to-human -human conversations that uh, a lot of stuff is actually happening in between the turns. Uh, there is a signal that people use to exhibit turn-taking behavior. There can be pauses, hesitations, uh, back-channel utterances, um, and many others. And so there is a lot of work on um, supporting uh, multi-step procedural tasks, but today we will focus on uh, particularly the naturalness aspect of that. Uh, so we set out to investigate what, um, what implicit behaviors people show when they go through a multi-step tasks. We show in our work the role and importance of implicit conversational cues. Um, and uh, conclude with design implications that follow from our findings. Okay, so um, as an example of the multi-step multi tasks, we chose to work with a recipe. So we conducted an experiment where um, we had a Wizard of Oz experiment where we asked participants to cook a recipe with the help of a simulated voice agent that was implemented using a Wizard of Oz design. So let's look at the timeline a little closer. First, we briefed uh, participants, had, this, had them sign consent form. We, um, they walked themselves, themselves uh, through the process of uh, cooking a recipe. Afterwards, we asked them to provide demographic uh, information, and we also asked them to, uh, to fill out NASA TLX and system usability score questionnaires. And these served as a sanity check for our Wizard of Oz design so that we know that this design uh, provides compelling experience for the users. Finally, we concluded with a verbal interview and debrief, uh, debriefed their participants about the Wizard of Oz uh, setup. So let's look at a, a little bit closer at this particular step of uh, the recipe preparation. As I said before, it was a Wizard of Oz design, and uh, from the participant side, um, they were given a printout of a recipe, all the necessary ingredients, and were instructed to talk with the agent uh, naturally as they would with another person. So talking a little bit more about the recipe, we needed something that we could um, 
cook in a lab setting, but uh, that was not entirely trivial. So we chose this recipe, which is essentially um, a spice rub for corn that required people to mix up um, a bunch of spices in different proportions and put them on, um, on a corn. Uh, talking about the wizard design now, we wanted to, our goal in designing the wizard was to make it uh, very simple, uh, consistent throughout the participants. Um, we wanted to minimize the time delay uh, in the, uh, in the, uh, with the answers. So what we essentially did, we took a recipe, um, put it apart, uh, put it apart in uh, small chunks, and we made each chunk a um, candidate answer that the wizard could choose from. So on the right hand side, or sorry, on the left hand side here, you can see um, the soundboard that we provided for the wizard. So they essentially would select one of the answers, click on it, and on the participant side, the text um, would, mm, the audio would play. Uh, based on the text-to-speech uh, service. So basically, what participants would hear is the synthesized voice. And uh, when we asked them later after the experiment, uh, none of them uh, suspected the wizard of our setup, which tells us that we did a fairly good job in that. Um, so who did, we, who did we work with? We asked uh, 10 fellow interns at Microsoft Research to come and help us out. We had 10 people, uh, six males and uh, four females, um, around 30 years old. It took them on average about seven minutes to uh, complete their uh, task and uh, 19 conversational turns. Most of them, seven people, uh, used some sort of a voice agent fairly, fairly recently, um, and also most of them would uh, stick with the recipe when they were cooking. Right, after the experiment, we transcribed and timestamped all user utterances as well as system utterances, and we classified user utterances into categories that I will talk about right now. So, um, we classified user categories, u sorry, user utterances into two categories that we called explicit queries and implicit cues. And for explicit queries, uh, we chose, uh, so we defined explicit queries categories, a category as um, utterances that were form formulated uh, using full sentence questions. For example, what's the next step? Or imperative commands, like next. And uh, they were characterized uh, overall by the fact that they did not need any context to be interpreted. So if you look at the what's the next step, you understand right away uh, what the person is asking of you. On the other hand, uh, with implicit cues, uh, their main characteristic was that you absolutely needed some context to understand what the person was asking for. So in this context, it could be conversational, so what turns happened before and after. It could be timing, it could be intonation, or it could be all of them together that you needed to understand what the person, is, um, what the person has in mind. Right? And the examples we have here, OK or sounds good, and here, OK could be um, a signal that the person has received the information and they understood it. Or um, they could say the same thing uh, with a different intonation, uh, signaling that they're ready to move on to the next step. And when we look at the distribution uh, between the explicit queries and implicit cues, we can see here in a dark gray, uh, these are explicit queries, they dominate but a quarter of all system utterances uh, were triggered by some sort of implicit cue. And all but one participant here uh, used some sort of implicit cues in their, um, uh, during, um, during um, their task. Uh, and just to uh, side note here, currently all those light gray uh, queries are not, uh, even, not even captured by the existing uh, system protocols. So let's dive deeper into each category. With explicit in, uh, queries, we saw everything that you would expect to see uh, while cooking a recipe. It was uh, asking for a next step, um, asking for ingredient and quantity, right? um, asking to repeat a response, uh, previous response, and asking for definitions of some words that, were, um, that occurred in the recipe. Um, Let's look, take a closer look at the types of implicit, implicit cues that we have observed and what behavior is this signaled about. So I will uh, talk about all of these in detail. First, uh, the most popular one, um, the most popular intent that we observed was a request for a next step. 
And these could be done using two different approaches. So uh, one approach is people would um, say short positive utterances like okay or sounds good. And the way it would uh, go is the system would uh, read out the response. Uh, the user would take some uh, pause to complete the step. And then we say okay, saying uh, or signaling that they were ready to um, advance in the, in the recipe. Alternatively, they could do the same thing. They could uh, express the same intent by paraphrasing um, paraphrasing previous system utterance. So here you can see um, that the user is uh, responding, OK, everything's blended, uh, by summarizing um, their actions, right? And uh, this is the same intent. I'm ready to move on. In other cases, um, the behavior that people exhibited through the sorry, implicit cues did not have any particular actionable intent. For example, here in grounding, um, they would say, OK, one pinch, signaling that they have received the information, um, and that's it. So it's basically a signal of the receipt of information. And a good life example of that might be some of you nodding along as I'm speaking right now. Um, Moving on, we also witnessed some confirmation questions uh, where people uh, that people used to confirm their beliefs um, to make sure that they were on the right track. So here, a person summarizing their actions and then in the end asking, right? So they were basically uh, yes, no questions. Uh, and finally, we observed a type of behavior where people uh, sort of repeated system response under their breath that was not directly addressed to the system, that was not directly addressed to anyone, really. And one hypothesis that we have is that this behavior is uh, really serving to update the short-term memory of the user, sort of you repeating garlic powder to yourself while you're looking for a garlic powder. Um, to wrap up, in our work, we found uh, that uh, implicit conversational cues um, are quite popular, and they uh, carry a lot of uh, potentially useful information that we would very like, uh, very much like to use. Um, we want to move on uh, and rec learn to recognize and properly react to such implicit cues. However, currently we do not have any means to do that since they're all being filtered out by the communication model that we're using. So how can we capture them? One option that might be worth considering is leaving the microphone longer, um, uh, microphone open longer, which of course poses its own challenges such as privacy and uh, so on. But uh, yeah, uh, further work needed on that. And uh, that's our work. I'll be happy to have questions to take questions. Plenty of time for questions. Please line up. Hi, thank you so much. Um, so I'm Ria from Purdue. So I had a question. Um, so did participants' familiarity with voice user interfaces influence how much they use explicit versus implicit cues? Um, we did not explicitly look at that because uh, there was this a fairly small sample of 10 people. right? And out of, the, of those 10 people, seven people were uh, extensively used the voice, uh, voice agents. But um, actually, the one person who has never used a uh, voice agent before, she was the most active with the conversational cues. Okay, thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> thank you for a great talk. Um, in, in the middle of your slides, you had a, a conversation dialogue where the user was responding to the instructions, uh, and, and there was this, and when talking about the implicit meaning, you had a pause mm -hmm. followed by the okay. Did you, um, in, in the course, which I appreciate is not part of the primary paper, look at the impact of time as it relates to me, i.e., the, the, the delay in time between the instruction and uh, sending back the either uh, you know, con more explicit confirmation like the okay or implicit confirmation like a paraphrase in terms of what kind, how strongly it reflects intent? Uh, so we relied mainly on the wizard being human and being able to distinguish that. We had uh, both video and audio recording. So um, as humans, we were able to differentiate between that very easily, right? Um, and that's what we relied on in our, um, in our labeling. Uh, we did not explicitly look at uh, the, like the exact amount of time uh, between 
the, uh, like the between the implicit queue and uh, the system response. Um, I'm pretty sure we would need much more data to look at that uh, reliably. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. uh, just one mm -hmm. quick follow up. The, the pause that you have up there, mm -hmm. yep. what was the presence, or if not the measurement mm -hmm. length of the pause, was the existence of a pause part of your transcription process? Uh, no, it's, it's just here for visual purposes. Okay. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have a question. Um, it strikes me a little bit, because uh, we actually did uh, some similar experiment, uh, also doing like task oriented and using wizard bots. Um, but what I observe here is much more natural than what we did. I mean, I was wondering, because uh, for us, it seems um, most people don't believe the agent have that intelligence to process some kind of implicit queue and those things. And I saw your data, there are some individual difference and variation? Do you have some hypothesis of why some people don't show that much, some mm -hmm. people show more? So I'm pretty sure that the fact that we ran this experiment in the lab environment uh, affected this a lot. Um, so as I mentioned, one person did not use ex implicit queues at, at all. And so she was fairly um, constrained and maybe feeling awkward. On the other hand, uh, some of the more outgoing people did not care what uh, they were, like what other people thought of them maybe, and uh, they sort of let themselves go. And I believe that's uh, how people would behave in their houses, right, in their homes, in their natural environments, uh, without having this um, mm, sort of the restrictions of the lab setting. Thank you. Let's thank our speaker and uh, move on to the next one.